So good evening my dear sisters and brothers and once again welcome to this uh, evening where we speak about our faith. Uh, we have been drawing inspiration from you who come every evening and want to grow in your faith. So among the many topics last week if you recall we spoke about the church law and I said that word canon law sometimes can be a put off. So we continue in the same topic of the laws of the church, the principles that guide us. Last week we spoke about the role and the obligations, the rights that you have as lay people to permeate the earth, to grow in your life of holiness, to evangelize and so on. We were fortunate that last Sunday His Eminence in the evening session of question and answers has given us a broad description about how we have the code of canon law and how there are seven books in that one code which gives us how we have to live a harmonious life in our relationship with God and with each other. I had spoken last week my dear friends about two aspects about the laity, about you in the church. The one was your life of holiness which includes essentially the sacramental life. So this evening and possibly the next week we will focus about the sacraments in the church. Some time ago Father Henry had given you a theological understanding about the sacraments. Theological understanding means about the way we live our faith, how our faith is then enunciated and explained to us, thought to us. We draw from this inspiration about the theology of the sacraments and then how the law of the church interprets this understanding about our faith. All of us know we have seven sacraments, there is no dispute about that. We also believe that these seven sacraments came from Jesus himself. We believe that these sacraments, my dear friends, are in some way helping us to grow in our spirituality. I told you the last session that these seven sacraments, you can ask as lay people from the church, Father, give us these sacraments. What are these seven sacraments? All of us know. So the first sacrament you know is sacrament of baptism. And then we prepare ourselves for sacrament of, yes, you are right, Holy Communion. But you also are aware that before Holy Communion, there is one more sacrament. And if you have paid attention, it is called sacrament of confession. Sometimes it is called confession. In the law of the church, it says penance. And then we have the sacrament of confirmation. You are right. After which, those who want to get married, there is a sacrament of marriage, which husband and wife give to each other. Then we have the sacrament of the priesthood, which is called holy orders. And for those who... Uh, feel they are in the time of need, going for a serious surgery, etc., or going to die, they call the priest for the sacrament of anointing, sometimes called viaticum, or in the earlier times it was called extreme unction. So these seven sacraments, my dear friends, in the church help us essentially to grow in a life of holiness. If you recall, in the session on the theology of sacraments, we were told what are these sacra sacraments, the definition. So, the definition of sacrament simply means it is an external sign, something that is done externally like the rite which is conducted, okay, the external action of the church, of the recipient, but more essentially of something that happens inwardly, happening inside us. So, it is called an external side of inward grace of God. So, we know that God's grace is available to us at all times but very efficaciously, especially at the time of receiving sacraments, we receive a very special grace from God. So let's take three sacraments today. I would like to speak about the sacrament of baptism. Second, we speak very briefly about sacrament of confirmation and thirdly about the sacrament of Eucharist called Holy Communion. What is the sacrament of baptism for each one of us? Last time I spoke, my dear friends, that in order to be a member of an organization like the church, one needs to be baptized. What happens with baptism? I mentioned to you, my dear friends, at baptism we receive the gift of God's life within us. And therefore, in order to receive this life of God, the church law simply tells us that as a Catholic minister, who can give the sacrament of baptism to a child? You always know it is a priest, you come to the church and ask the priest, he is called the ordinary minister. There could be also the bishop surely and then we have also deacons. Some of you are aware of them, they come and conduct the evening services for us One of some, sometimes in this week. So you will see they are called deacons, even they can baptize. 
But there are moments, my dear friends, which can be very difficult for couples. Sometime in hospitals, there are emergencies. The law of the church permits any person who has the right intention to baptize somebody who is in danger of death, a child who is born, may not survive, there is an accident, something happens tragic and the person, the child is not baptized, the law of the church permits anyone who has the right intention to baptize. It is very essential, my dear friends, that when baptism is taking place, to make it a valid act. What makes truly a baptism in the Catholic Church is the act, the formula. What is required? Firstly, the priest or the minister of baptism, he baptizes in the name of the Trinity. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the Trinitarian formula. And then he also pours water at the same time. So my dear friends, to make a baptism valid, the law of the church requires essentially that the water is poured over the child or sometimes even immersed in some font and the Trinitarian formula which is used. So the ordinary minister is a priest, a deacon, a bishop surely, but sometimes in emergency even another lay person can baptize. Now please don't go ahead and baptize your children at home unnecessarily. Okay, So that's not an emergency situation. You have to come to church and ask the church to baptize your child. These are only for emergency situations. We know that baptism cannot be repeated. Just because you did not like a particular church or that you were not aware about the baptism, you cannot come and say, baptize my child again. Baptism takes place only once. Okay, So you cannot choose to baptize a child again because you cannot remember whether the child was baptized or not or because you didn't like a particular church or a country or people were not present. You cannot say my parents were not there and this one was not there. No. So it's baptism takes place just once. There is also at the right of baptism someone whom we call Godparents. Right? In the church law, my dear friends, the word Godparents is not mentioned. The word that is mentioned for Godparents is sponsor. Now you know this term sponsor can be very misleading. Huh? Sponsor is one of somebody who gives you something, a benefit. Sometimes there can be the danger in choosing your godparents. Whom would you want to choose? Very often we like to choose our friends, sometimes relatives, close people who are close to us. Their role, my dear friends, is simply to help the parents in the uplifting and the growth of the child in its faith. It's not about providing gifts as sponsors would. So please remember that uh, at baptism, we also require to bring godparents. Sometimes there are requests, Father, can we bring two who are men? or two who are women as, as godparents, the church law says no, there has to be one male and one female. right? So you cannot say two men or two women can be godparents, it has to be of either gender. Next, in order to be a uh, sponsor, my dear friends, the person must be a Catholic who is baptized over the age of 16 and has received the sacrament of confirmation. Why is that? Because it is expected that the godparents supply this child with the faith that is required to grow in the faith. So that's very briefly about the sacrament of baptism. Sometimes in the church, we also have, besides children being brought to the church, we also have adult baptism. It goes back in history. After the death resurrection of Jesus, the apostles who went and they preached the gospel, they evangelized, they went on baptizing people. We must know that people were baptized and came into the faith as families. So not only children, but they were adults. So today also in the church, as a continuity of that legacy of the apostles, we continue to even baptize adults in the church. There's a beautiful rite called the RCRA, Rite for Christian Initiation of Adults. All over the world, those who wish to accept the Catholic faith, accept Jesus as their Lord and Master, have to go through this one year preparation. So even adults can come to the church and ask for baptism. Once again, children can be brought by their parents, adults come by their own intention. Same formula is used, baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, water is poured or by immersion. This is for the validity along with the godparents. That's about in brief about the sacrament of baptism. I'll run through very briefly with the sacrament of confirmation. We are all aware, my dear friends, that Confirmation is an acceptance of my belief in God and about my faith. As a child, it is my parent or and my godparents who say yes, that I will grow up in the faith. 
And so parents and godparents make promises at the time of my baptism that I will grow up in the Catholic faith and believe in this God of mine. Now as an adult, I have to give this affirmation. And the sacrament of confirmation simply means that confirming my faith, what my parents and godparents promised on my behalf. So to do that, my dear friends, I must be conscious of what I'm saying yes to. And therefore, in our diocese, we have that soon after the class 10 exams are over, we initiate the students in a year's preparation to accept my faith. And therefore, there is a time for preparation. You cannot say one day, Father, I have not received confirmation. Please confirm me. No, there is a need for preparation for you to understand the teachings of the church. Meet about scriptures, about ethics, about morals. So many topics are taken in order to help us understand our faith and give assent to it, to affirm it. Now, that's about who can receive confirmation. Once again, confirmation can be received only once. You cannot say, I am not sure whether I receive confirmation or no. Or I did not like the bishop who was there. Or I was not comfortable with going to this church and therefore I did some. So you cannot do that. Confirmation comes just once, my dear friends. Very often I have asked my uh, friends and relatives, what do you receive about the sacrament of confirmation? And I am sure you will remember the same thing. That bishop slapped me on my face. He gave me a pat. My dear friends, there is nothing to do about that pat which is required for the sacrament of confirmation. There is no connection. The sacrament of conf confirmation is valid when the bishop lays his hand on the candidate, prays for the gift of the Holy Spirit and says, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and anoints on the forehead with the oil of chrism, the same oil which a child is baptized with also. So this oil, my dear friends, is blessed at what is called the chrism mass just before Monday, Thursday at the Paschal season. So that's about how the rite of confirmation takes place. Who can confirm? You've seen very often in your churches, a priest cannot administer the sacrament of confirmation. He doesn't have that faculty. It is the right of the bishop who can confirm. So you've seen bishops coming, you've taken photographs, certificate sign, bishop so and so has confirmed you, right? So it's only a bishop who can confirm a candidate for confirmation. Yes, there are times when somebody who has missed out on the sacrament of confirmation and then has progressed in age, at some time he or she feels that the confirmation sacrament was not received, the priest will have to ask for special permission to give him what you call faculty, the power to confirm an adult. So priest in himself cannot give the sacrament of confirmation. He requires a special mandate, a special permission from the bishop. Once again, let us stress, my dear friends, the importance for the preparation. So while the law says who can confirm, who can receive the sacrament of confirmation, we would like to reiterate the importance of that period of confirming or preparing for the sacrament of confirmation because you give assent to your faith. And finally, for this evening, I would like to speak a little bit on the sacrament of Eucharist, a sacrament that all of us have been longing for. Four months have gone by. Each of us in your homes has been waiting to receive the Lord in the Eucharist. We pray, my dear friends, that at some time in the near future, we are allowed to go to our churches and worship that Lord. That Lord whom in the canon law which speaks about reminds us that it is Jesus who is actually present there. He is not symbolically present. He is actually present in his own flesh and blood. This is what the law of the church teaches. That it is Jesus who instituted the sacrament. It is he who said, take this, my body, broken, given to you. We are longing to receive him. We, receive, we remember that day, hopefully, my dear friends, we have pictures of our first Holy Communion. When we were looking forward with all eagerness, we wanted to receive Jesus in the Holy Species for the first time. And what joy in our hearts, because we believe that Jesus who is really present in the Eucharist has now become, as St. Paul says, I no longer live, it is Christ who lives in me. It is Jesus who loves me, who died for me, according to the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Chapter 2 says, Christ loved me, he died for me. I receive him in his own body, in his own flesh. And therefore, we long for this Lord. We have received him in the sacrament. And what is required, my dear friends, to receive him worthily in this sacrament of the Eucharist? Let's first focus on who is the one who can celebrate 
the sacrament of the Eucharist. At times this word Eucharist and Mass is used interchangeably in the law. Even in our public usage of language, we say I went for Holy Mass, priest says I celebrated Eucharist, sometimes he says I celebrated Mass. They are not to be confused, they are used interchangeably. Even in the law of the church, this word is used sometimes as Mass and sometimes as Eucharist. So it's only a priest who by his ordination as a priest can celebrate the Holy Eucharist. No deacon, no permanent deacon, sorry you cannot do that. It's only a validly ordained priest allowed by the church to celebrate the Holy Eucharist. And my dear friends, even for him to be celebrating the Eucharist, he goes through a preparation in his own person every day before Mass and after Mass, he has to prepare himself. Because as the law of the church says that the priest is standing there in the person of Christ. He is not cele celebrating Mass in himself as Father Neil or as Father Meldroy or as Father Lester or whoever else, not celebrating in his person. The teaching of the law of the church says he celebrates in the person of Christ and therefore my dear friends he has to be present in himself without any sin. The law of the church says if any person either celebrating mass or wanting to receive holy eucharist he must be without any mortal sin. He is not supposed to celebrate mass or to receive the holy eucharist. So a priest is required to live his life of holiness come to the eucharist and celebrate mass. The law of the church says that Eucharist or the Mass can be celebrated for anyone, living or dead. No? So you can come and say somebody's birthday, somebody's anniversary, somebody's good health. To get a job, you offer Mass. The law of the church also says if anyone has died, we have people offering Masses for those who have died, sometimes months mind, after an anniversary and then any time of the year you feel the need to offer Mass, the law of the church allows you, anyone, living or dead. Don't bring your pets to church and say, Father, my dog died, my cat died. Please offer mass. No? So it's not meant for animals. No? It's meant for those who are living or those who have died. We can offer mass for them. When the priest offers mass, my dear friends, you'll see that he consecrates two species, bread and wine. No? He cannot choose to consecrate something else. The law of the church says only bread and only wine because Jesus at the Last Supper he takes bread and he takes wine and he gives it. He says, this is my body, this is my blood. So he has to consecrate both species. The priest knows about it, he has been trained for it. But sometimes people ask, Father, why only bread and wine? So the law of the church very clearly says, only species of bread and wine. So that's about the role of the priest. There are so many other things that the priest has to remember while celebrating Mass. He's thought about in this, in his study in the seminary. We'll focus more about you, my dear friends, when you come to receive Holy Communion. The first time you received Communion, there was a particular age that you were given Holy Communion. The law of the church says that an, a child who has now received or reached the age of reason, in the code of canon law, the law says the age of reason is about seven years, completed seven years. At this time, the child is able to distinguish between what he had in the morning as bread or toast from the Eucharistic bread, the Lord himself. The child should be able to make that distinction. It's not like he's eating the same bread. So he has to re realize, he or she has to realize that he's receiving the very body of Christ. He should be able to make that distinction. Sometimes jokingly people ask us, Father, you had wine today morning. No, sometimes you are fooling with us. No, that's not we are drinking wine. We drink the very body and the blood of Christ. We drink his blood, just like you receive his body. We receive his body and his blood. So my dear friends, when the child is has reached that age of reason, after the age of seven or eight, the child can be admitted to the sacrament of Holy Communion. After this, my dear friends, people ask, Father, how often must we receive Holy Communion? The law of the church prescribes, my dear friends, that at least once a year you must come to church. Huh? I know that most of us come to church every Sunday as far as possible. Some of them come every day. I know how much you value the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ. But some for whatever reason come sometimes. But the obligation of the church is to come at least once a year. Now don't stop coming to church because I am saying this, right? So the obligation is there to come every Sunday. The prescriptions of the church given by God to Moses, keep the Sabbath holy, is to come to church every Sunday. In fact, when you study the Ten Commandments which Father Stephen has been doing, you will learn that not going to church on a Sunday just because you don't want to actually 
you know, you commit in some sense mortal sin. Some people have uh, failed to recognize this or maybe has forgotten. So it's about receiving the Lord as often as possible. No? Because as often as possible you receive the Lord, you grow in your life of holiness. Jesus is living in you. So the obligation is yes to come to church every Sunday. Some people ask, Father, if I come to church twice or thrice, can I receive communion all these times? The law of the church has prescribed yes. If you come to church a second time at some mass, for example, you go for a Sunday mass, the evening there's a wedding or there's a funeral or you happen to go to another church or you come to your same church twice a day, you can receive twice in a day. But if you make it a habit to come to three, four masses, sometimes people have their devotion to the Eucharist. It is not right, not proper to receive Eucharist more than twice a day. So that's about how often one can receive the sacrament of Eucharist. There's also this confusion sometimes people ask, Father, how much should I fast before coming to receive the Lord in the Eucharist? You know, when I was growing up, I was always told, fast one hour before you go to church. And then I used to like, it's quite a struggle, no? To stay without breakfast, one hour and then after that Sunday school and all, we used to feel very bad. How will I manage? But the law of the church is very clear that you abstain from any food or drink one hour before you receive Holy Communion. I am clarifying that, not before Mass begins, but one hour before you receive Holy Communion. So if you go for a weekday Mass, Mass is at 7, Holy Communion is about 7.15, no, 7.20, then one hour before that. Now don't start calculating time, it will create a lot of confusion or don't keep your alarm one hour before. The rule is to live by its spirit, no, so that we are prepared to receive Jesus without any you know, particles in our mouth or, you know, without much of reference, reverence. So the rule of uh, the abstinence simply says one hour before you receive the Lord, you must do your uh, abstinence from eating food or drink. Now for those who are elderly, those who are on medication, for those who take care of the sick, do not worry, please. The rule of fasting and abstaining from any food or drink is excuse. Uh, so after the age that you feel you are now not possible because of your uh, age or because of your health reasons, your medication, the rule of fasting is exempted. We have also a situations in the danger of death. Sometimes somebody is very sick, somebody is going to die. As I mentioned, the priest is called to give the sacrament of Holy Eucharist. You must take advantage, just not during Mass, but even when somebody is sick, somebody is on the deathbed or somebody is going for a major surgery, you can call a priest and receive Holy Communion. Those who are present there, even if you have attended two or three Masses, you can ask for the Lord in the Holy Communion. Just two more points, my dear friends, before we wind up, is about the reservation of the Eucharist in the Blessed Sacrament. The Church law says that after Mass is over, species are left kept for our reverence. So the law allows us, because in some churches like the Protestants, they don't have this law which says you can go and adore the Lord. But the Church law permits us to adore the Lord in the Eucharist. Just one point, my dear friends, which may not be like an everyday uh, discussion for us. There are some times in certain countries when you have been and uh, you may land up in a place where there is no Catholic Church and then people feel the loss of receiving Holy Communion. There is a possibility in certain churches only where you can receive Holy Communion. I am just sounding this to you. For more clarity, you can always contact a Catholic Church and ask which church can I go where I can receive Holy Communion? We pray, my dear friends, that these, uh, this time that we have spent in trying to understand what you call the sacraments of Christian initiation, baptism, confirmation and Eucharist, three sacraments which initiate us into a Christian life is beneficial for you. We pray that this time will help us grow in our intimacy with God, that we may realize our spirituality to go to the sacraments as often as possible, especially as we spoke about the Eucharist that we go as often as possible so that we may receive sacramental grace, the very life of God. God bless you. Have a nice evening and time with prayer now.
because he's given Jesus Christ his son give thanks with a grateful heart give thanks to the Holy One give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, we have entered into this prayer service by singing a hymn of thanksgiving. With our hearts full of praise, we always find more and more reasons to thank God for. So many reasons to thank God for already, but today let us thank God in a very special way for these evening sessions which we've been having day after day for the last couple of months ever since the lockdown, where we have been taught various aspects of the Catholic faith and where we have grown in our knowledge of what exactly it means to be a Catholic. In a very special way, let us thank God for this evening's teaching where Father Neil Santos has catechized us on the sacraments on how important they are for us, how essential they are to our Christian living, and how unique our sacraments are, and how efficacious they are in transmitting grace to us who receive them. When we look at the sacraments, we realize that all the seven sacraments take us across the entire length of our lives. At every stage of our life, every moment of our life, there are sacraments which nourish us, beginning from baptism, right up to anointing of the sick and at every stage the sacraments call us to holiness to a deeper relationship with God you and I have received so many sacraments but we will be the first to admit that we have not necessarily grown very much in the holiness which the sacraments expect of us when we look at our lives with all its sinfulness, with all the turmoil that goes within, it stands in stark contrast to the holiness which the sacraments are calling us to. How often we struggle with all the difficulties and challenges which we face in our life. Today, during this prayer service, we offer these struggles to God. You are not alone in this struggle as you seek to grow in holiness. Saint Paul himself felt this struggle. And so in Romans chapter 7 verse 80, Saint Paul tells us that the good things which I want to do, I don't do. And the evil which I choose not to do, I yet end up doing. I'm sure this words of Saint Paul echo your sentiments and mine too. We are trying our best and God understands. But St. Paul also explains how then we have to deal with this struggle. St. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 that one of the reasons why we fail in our struggle to grow in holiness is because we are wrestling not against flesh and blood but against the powers of darkness, against principalities, against the cosmic powers and the spiritual powers of evil. Against this cosmic evil power you and I in our human weakness can never find victory and therefore we have to have an alternative. We need a savior. We need a messiah. No human being can withstand the onslaught of this cosmic power. But there is one man, one man who withstood it, overcame it 
and triumphed over it. The man, Jesus Christ. So today let us turn to Jesus, the man who overcame evil and who enabled us, therefore, to imitate him and do likewise. What we require to do, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, is admit that all our lives we have not necessarily taken the help of God, involved God in our struggle. We have dwelt only and depended on our own human strengths and therefore failed. Let us bring to mind these struggles which you and I are going through at this point of time. And these struggles we will bring before the Lord and sing to him this hymn. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my voice. And the first verse of this song tells us, Remember not the sins of my youth, but we will sing remember not the sins of my past. And I don't tell you to remember your sins like anger, pride, stealing, avarice, etc. But the root of these sins, which is depending on ourselves to overcome this world without depending totally and fully on Christ. And as we sing this song, my dear brothers and sisters, offer your life totally and completely to the Lordship of Jesus. Let him assist you in your struggle as you grow towards holiness. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my voice. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my voice, O oh my God, I trust in Thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. And surely with Jesus at our side, we will see that our enemies, this cosmic power, doesn't triumph over us. We come to the second stage, my dear brothers and sisters, of our prayer service, whereby we acknowledge that we are dealing not with flesh and blood, but with things of the spirit. And therefore, it is very difficult for us to accept the things which Jesus would tell us to do with our human capacity and limitations. Therefore, we require to have faith. And all our sacraments presuppose faith that we must believe in what we don't see and don't understand, but just trust and have faith in Jesus. The way we begin by growing in faith is by first of all believing in the presence of God, becoming aware of God's presence in all of creation. In the Old Testament we see that the people of God always depended on the presence of God. In the book of Exodus, chapter 13, verse 21, you have the presence of God in the cloud, in the pillar of cloud by day, as he led the people out of Egypt into the promised land, and as a pillar of fire by night. It is because of this presence that they felt assured that God is with us and we can go through this most grueling time of our life. They believed in the presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant. And so you see Joshua in the book of Joshua chapter 6 verse 6 whereby they are walking around the walls of Jericho. An impossible task it seems. But they march with the Ark of the Covenant in front of them. And they achieve a massive victory. You will see this repeatedly. Moses in Numbers chapter 31 verse 6. You will have Samuel, you will have David in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 11. All of them carry the Ark of the Covenant into battle because they believe in the presence of God which will give them victory. We see this also, my dear brothers and sisters, in the New Testament, whereby the presence of Jesus makes such a big difference to the people who are around him. And that is why we have in Luke's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 24, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they feel good with Jesus' presence and tell Jesus, stay with us, Lord. You have Mary in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, when Lazarus dies, tells with if you were present, my brother would not have died. The presence of Jesus made the difference. 
It is the presence that we see today as Jesus has gone ahead of us, ascended, of Jesus in the sacraments. And today you and I, my dear brothers and sisters, require to put our faith and our belief and our trust in the presence of Jesus in the sacraments. It looks so difficult, so impossible. And yet we are called to grow in the knowledge of this presence. Jesus told us in his final discourse, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, to baptize all people in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but also to teach them to do everything that I have commanded you to do. And so therefore, let us now ask God to give us this grace to grow in an awareness of his presence in our life. And then slowly to become aware, not just of Jesus' presence in the sacraments, but as we receive an appropriate grace from the sacraments, we also begin to experience his presence in the world around us. And so we'll sing the second verse of this hymn. And we will say, teach me, Lord, your ways. Teach me your paths so that I can recognize your presence everywhere around me. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my voice. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my voice. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. Teach me your ways, your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me your paths, your path, O oh Lord. Oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. And even as my dear brothers and sisters, we have asked Jesus to carry all our burdens with him against this cosmic enemy. To help us to grow in our faith, to believe in his presence and to appropriate the grace in the sacraments. We now come to the third part of our prayer service whereby we look at our response we see that the presence of jesus was met with two kinds of responses some of them just ignored the presence of jesus and went about their own way but there were a few who recognized the presence of jesus and had an encounter with him and it is having this encounter with the presence of jesus which transforms our life and we see this very much in so many passages in the Bible. We know that Jesus did the will of the Father. Everything that the Father told him to do and say, he did it here on earth. And then he breathed the Holy Spirit upon the disciples and told them to do likewise. Today, the church, through the sacraments, reenacts and continues the same work of Jesus. It is an extension of Jesus continuing his mission in this world through the sacraments in the church. And you and I are called to encounter him, encounter his presence in these sacraments. And so look at your situation today and reflect. At whichever stage of life you are in, you are covered by the grace of a sacrament. You yourself have received so many sacraments and therefore the turmoil that goes within you in spite of you seeking God can be addressed when you encounter this Christ. Just leave yourself open to allow the Spirit of God with Jesus breathed upon the church to consume you now. Do you find yourself ostracized cut off by society, looked down by people. You feel that you are neglected, that life is meaningless, that I am a person who is rejected by everyone in this world. Well, we are told in John's Gospel, chapter 4, that there was a Samaritan woman who felt the same way, totally rejected by everyone. And yet, when she encountered Jesus, there was a joy in her heart. 
she forgot everything what mattered to her was that this encounter with jesus would enable me to have a new relationship with everyone and anyone irrespective of how they treat me and so therefore approach the sacraments my dear brothers and sisters with this knowledge and this faith that you will encounter the grace of christ and you will be able to face acceptance in this world because god gives you that grace have that joy in your heart do you feel difficult to leave your sinful habits something which is holding you in bondage you're finding it difficult to surrender to leave everything look at luke's gospel chapter 19 where you have zacchaeus a man who was clinging to his riches and to power and to prestige and yet he has an encounter with jesus and when he has an encounter with jesus nothing else matters he is prepared to leave and give everything away today when you approach the sacraments once again appropriate this grace with this faith that god will give you that grace to surrender your weakness to surrender your sinful habits and bondages and you will be able to lead a free and joyful life like Zacchaeus did. Are you in fear and trembling, worried about what the situation around you is, that everyone is persecuting you? Look at the apostles in the upper room. And on the day of the resurrection, Jesus appears. And once they encounter the risen Christ, they are filled with courage and with boldness. And they can boldly go out and rejoice. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, whatever stage of life you are in, whatever trials and tribulations you are going through, the place to go is the sacraments to appropriate this grace. And so therefore, let us sing this hymn, I surrender all and give all these burdens to Christ and enable him through his sacramental presence to transfer and confer grace upon us to lead joyful lives. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. And as we come to the end of this prayer service, my dear brothers and sisters, let us remember that ultimately God desires to communicate with us and to reveal to us his presence. And at the presentation in the temple, we see Simeon carrying the baby Jesus and saying, my eyes have seen the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy. When you and I approach the sacraments, May we be see the presence of Jesus in the sacraments and also say we can recognize the messianic prophecy. Right behind me in this church over here at St. Peter's in Bandra, we have the statue of the sacred heart of Jesus. And there is a bold caption down where Jesus says, come. Hundreds and thousands of devotees come to this church and have commented about how comforted they felt when they saw Jesus welcoming them with these words. Jesus comes, he ever comes. But also he calls you. And so therefore, what will your response be? So today let us end this prayer service by singing the hymn, I'll say yes, yes, yes. Where you lead me, I will follow. May the sacramental presence of Christ in the church lead and guide us to a wonderful holy life ahead. I'll say yes, yes, yes. I'll say yes, yes, yes. I'll say yes, Lord. 
I'll say yes, Lord. I'll say yes, yes, yes. Where you lead me, I will follow. Where you lead me, I will follow. Where you lead me, I will follow. I'll go with you, yes, with you, all the way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Thank you.